Since 1961, 157 orcas have died in captivity, many of them at a much younger age than if they had been in the wild. The number of orcas recorded as dying whilst being captured is 15. At this time, there are 67 orcas in captivity, kept in woefully inadequate conditions, which contributes to these premature deaths and the misery these noble creatures suffer. So why should orcas and any other cetacean not be kept in captivity? A revealing paper was published in 2019 on the harmful effects of captivity and chronic stress on the well-being of orcas. Describing some of the abnormal behaviours exhibited by orcas whilst in captivity and the premature death of many of them. To understand why orcas suffer from stress in captivity, we first need to understand a little about what sentient beings they are and what life in the ocean is like for them. MRI images have been taken of their brains and analysed. The consensus is that orca brains show that they are capable of complex cognitive and social functions, such as attention, prediction, social awareness and empathy. They show deep emotions and strong social attachments, something which was exemplified by Taliqua, the orca who carried her dead calf with her for 17 days in July 2018, before finally letting it go. Orcas live in pods, which can be defined as those orcas that are usually seen travelling together. They are comprised of extended families of closely related mothers, that is daughters, sisters or cousins and their children. The number of individuals in a pod varies, but for resident orcas of the Pacific Northwest, a pod may number from around 5 to 50 individuals. Changes to pod composition is slow, as individuals are long-lived, with males typically living for about 30 years but can live up to at least 60, and females are usually living up to 50 years but can live up to at least 90 years. Calves are weaned from their mothers at 1 to 2 years of age, but will come for a sneaky drink for another 2 to 3 years. Calves learn cultural traditions from their mothers, for example on how to forage for food. Vocal dialects are also an important part of orca culture. Dialect similarity is related to group closeness. The more related you are, the more similar your dialect. And just like us, it takes years of learning from their mothers and other close family members to master this skill of communication. And also just like us, it is central to their lives to find food, mates, and maintain social bonds. Orcas will spend time swimming long distances in their pods and not just for finding food. A maximum daily distance of 252 kilometres was measured for one pod and sustained distances of 160 to 225 kilometres per day for up to 40 days have also been recorded. Synchronised diving also occurs, with some individuals diving as deep as 750 metres several times a day. Other orcas have been observed to dive deeper than 150 metres at least every five hours. So one day, someone comes and takes you away from your family from your ability to swim for miles and dive as deep as you like and forage for your own food. You are put in a concrete tank, possibly with other orcas who speak a different dialect and fed dead food that you have probably never eaten before. The social structure is completely different or perhaps doesn't even exist. And all of this could have happened at a very young age. The youngest orca captured, Kotar, is thought to have been only one year old at the time. It is perhaps not surprising then that the lifespan of an orca in captivity is less than in the wild. Although survival rates have improved since 1985 through better husbandry and veterinary care, research carried out by the Orca Project have found that, on average, captive orcas survive less than 10 years in captivity. Although some, like Lolita in Miami and Corky too in Sewell, California, have been in captivity for nearly 50 years. The main cause of death was found to be due to viral, bacterial and fungal infections, gastrointestinal disease and trauma. Many of the infections were opportunistic infections, that is infections caused by pathogens which are not normally harmful. But under certain circumstances, such as a weakened immune system, exposure to chemical irritants, trauma to the skin or improper use of antimicrobials can cause disease. There has been much research carried out on the effect stress can have on the well-being of individuals, particularly in humans. And it is an established fact that stress can impair your immune system, making you more prone to infectious disease. The stresses faced by orcas living in captivity are many. Due to the complex social structure that orcas live in, where they rarely leave their maternal group and have close bonds with their mothers, 
Calves which are removed from their pod have suffered from the breaking of this bond, affecting their well-being and survival. Many captive orcas are moved from one dolphinarium to another, entering one artificial pod and then another one. These man-made pods are another form of stress for the individual. With no clear matriarch, social dysfunction occurs, sometimes resulting in aggressive behaviour towards each other and their trainers. There are many examples of bullying and injuries. Orcas are known to sustain cuts and be rammed by other orcas, usually by members who are higher up the hierarchy, something which has not been observed in the wild. Due to the confined space in which the orcas are kept, they are unable to move away from another orca which wishes to cause them harm and have been seen to enter ledges in an attempt to get away from their tormentor. In 1989 at SeaWorld California, a female orca called Kandu bled to death from a severed artery in her upper jaw after charging another female called Corky. Kandu initiated the charge in an apparent act of asserting her dominance but missed Corky and hit a wall. This physical environment is woefully inadequate to meet the needs of orcas in other ways. By US standards, the minimum length of the pool allowed is 15 metres and the minimum depth is 4 metres. Given, as mentioned earlier, that they may roam hundreds of kilometres in any one day and dive to depths of around 150 metres, their concrete tank is indeed very small. It also doesn't contain the rich environment found in the ocean, the other marine life, rocky and sandy substrates and the natural sounds found in the ocean. It is just a concrete tank. This concrete tank environment also causes other problems. Chemicals are used to keep the pool clean, which can cause eye irritations. Pumps are used to filter the water constantly. That means a constant noise for the orcas to have to listen to. There is also the noise that comes from the audience during show times and the loud music, with no escape, even for those not performing. The small size of the tanks and the lack of stimulation causes some behaviours which lead to harm. For example, logging, which is where the orca spends long periods of time near the surface, listless and immobile. Another behaviour is catatonic like bottom resting. Wild orcas move for 99% of their time, whilst a male orca in captivity, observed over a 24 hour period, moves for only 30.4% of the time. In males this inactivity leads to dorsal fin collapse, where the fin has quite literally collapsed to one side due to the effect of gravity. It is seen in about 1% of wild orcas, but in 100% of captive ones. Spending so much time with their heads above water leads to health problems such as mosquito-transmitted diseases, which at least two captive orcas have died from. Some orcas have experienced sunburn due to their logging behaviour, and also to the fact that their tanks are shallow and have clear water. Also, wild orcas tend to live at higher latitudes, where the UV light is less intense. Many orcas have had sunblock applied to them, to keep them safe from the harmful rays. But the additional UV light that orcas are exposed to also causes eye problems such as cataracts, which impairs their vision. It is known that Lolita, who is in captivity at Miami Sea Aquarium, suffers from pterygium, which is surfer's eye, which is caused by excessive exposure to ultraviolet radiation, resulting in discomfort, impaired visual function and blindness. She has been in captivity for 50 years, since she was about four years old, and is one of the few orcas that have survived such a long prison sentence. This has turned into a rather long video, so I have decided to put it into two parts. In part two, I will discuss self-harming behaviour in orcas and the controversy of breeding orcas in captivity.